Hi there. I am Evelyn D. Dominicus from EvelynD.com, and I am here to share with you information about insulin resistance, your thyroid, and metabolism, and how everything kind of works together uh, and can pose some problems if we are not working on our nutrition and lifestyle. So let's begin. First, a little bit about me, just the highlights. So I am a board certified, certified nutrition specialist. I have a master's degree in functional medicine nutrition. I'm also a life coach, a yoga teacher, an intuitive healer. Um, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's, which is autoimmune thyroid disease in 2002, after I gave birth to my third daughter, who is now 18. Um, my dad has diabetes, um, type 2 diabetes, and he manages it with diet and lifestyle and some supplements, and he is on metformin, but he's doing really well. Um, he's 78. My, um, I went through menopause when I was 47, so I am 52 now. Um, that was in 2015. My period stopped, so I am menopausal, just something that I'm going to touch on later, kind of connecting those dots. I have decades of yo-yo dieting, intense exercise, you name it, restriction, all kinds of things to try to manage my weight in the past. Um, I also have a history of gut issues, adrenal exhaustion, hormonal imbalances, and I even had heavy metals with high mercury and lead. Um, so now, today, I am diet-free, no yo-yo dieting. It's not part of my lexicon or anything that I do. Um, I have balanced weight and hormones, uh, peace and ease around food. My Hashi's is in remission, and I enjoy wine and other indulgences weekly. So I specialize in helping women in midlife optimize their nutrition and their lifestyle in a way that's empowering, that gives them balance with their weight, their hormones, their gut, whatever. Um, and I get into kind of that root, root cause, the whole mindset piece that is so important when it comes to how we actually behave, our food choices, et cetera. All right, so today we are talking about insulin resistance and how it connects with your thyroid and your metabolism. So what is insulin resistance? So the analogy that I love and I always use is think of it as the boy who cried wolf, right? So he kept crying wolf and so nobody would let him in because he kept basically lying. Um, and so with instant re resistance in the body, this is a physiological state where your blood sugar um, is elevated either through carbohydrate intake uh, that is too high for your current capacity, as well as stress can be another thing that can raise your blood glucose, your blood sugar. And when that happens, your pancreas will secrete insulin to bring the body into homeostasis or balance um, because it's very dangerous to have elevated blood sugar. You could die um, or you know, have really severe reactions. So the pancreas secretes the insulin to package that blood sugar and bring it to your muscle tissues, your liver. And if those two areas are at capacity, it will store the excess insulin with the blood sugar package in fat cells, right? So this is how we gain weight if we are insulin resistant. So what happens though is when those cells are like kind of getting this barrage of, of signaling of blood glucose is high, blood glucose is, glucose is high, either through too much um, carbohydrate intake and or too much stress, um, the cells start to say, treat the package of insulin with the glucose as, mm -mm, you know, I'm not going to let you into this cell. So the pancreas is like, well, then I'm just gonna keep producing insulin. And so there's excess insulin. And when that happens, that can increase um, inflammation. It can increase weight. It can cause all kinds of symptoms. And one of the most um, uh, dangerous is it can lead to diabetes. And then, as you know, diabetes can lead to all a host of other symptoms and disease states as well. So insulin sensitivity is something that we want. Insulin resistance is what we don't want, right? So we want to be sensitive to insulin and not resistant to insulin so that the body is running optimally. So 
another example here, another graphic in terms of we eat food, the pancreas makes insulin, the cells resist, they learn how to resist the insulin, and then the sugar gets stored as fat, we feel terrible, like we're tired, we're hungry all the time, and so we kind of keep perpetuating the cycle. And from a hormonal perspective, the hypothalamus and the brain, along with the pituitary, communicates to our endocrine system. So the thyroid, the pancreas, the adrenals, and our sex hormones. So everything is always communicating with one another, which is what can explain the connection between low thyroid function or even high thyroid function, like hyperactive thyroid or hypo underactive thyroid and insulin resistant. There is a, always a connection. Here's some, uh, some snippets from a study um, that kind of shows this. It's a study in 2015. Um, and basically just, just emphasizing the connection between insulin resistance and thyroid hormone. Um, a couple of things I wanted to point out here in the highlights is one, plasma glucose level were not significantly different among groups. So that in this specific study, they took uh, people that were, had thyroid issues and didn't, and with the insulin resistance, their gl blood glucose wasn't much different. So that, this is something I'm gonna talk about a little bit. So just because your blood glucose is normal doesn't necessarily mean you are efficiently managing your insulin. Um, and then another point here is um, the serum thyroid hormone, but not TSH, were considered to be associated. So a lot of doctors, the conventional labs will only look at T TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, to assess how your thyroid's doing, but they need to actually look at the actual thyroid hormones, T4, T3, so that they can assess So the gold standard when it comes to these studies is something you might've picked up on the panel, but you probably might have to ask for insulin. Uh, in my insurance, it's covered. So I'm always asking because I want to see how my body's doing. Um, and just even if you wanted to do a quick and dirty with um, understanding your insulin uh, optimization, your fasting insulin should be under three. Anything between two and five is considered optimal from a functional medicine perspective. So looking at that fasting insulin is something that you can start to talk about with your doctor. Here are other signs of insulin resistance. One, obesity, right? So losing weight alone can help reverse insulin resistance. A waistline, um, specifically a waist to hip ratio of 0.8 for men or 0.7 for women. Um, anything above that would be considered uh, a risk factor for insulin resistance, um, which is again, that kind of precursor to diabetes. High blood pressure, high fasting triglycerides, anything over 150. Um, ideally, you kind of even want that to be under 100. Um, and then you, any kind of low HDL is also, so it's really that triglyceride HDL ratio that is indicative of insulin resistance. Um, other signs are skin tags, uh, dark skin patches, um, and you want your fasting glucose to be under 95, ideally, anything but between 85 and 100. And there is a lot of bio-individuality -individu um, in this regard. And stress also plays a big role in terms of how you're managing your blood sugar. And you want your HbA1c to be less than 6%. 4.6 .6 to 5.4 is ideal. So those are other things you can look at. So what are some, some other risk factors besides obesity and all the things that I mentioned before? One is your genetics. 
So I mentioned in the intro slide that my dad has type two diabetes. So I know that my fasting insulin and my fasting glucose tends to run high when I'm not doing the right things. So, however, this does not mean that you are destined for insulin resistance or diabetes. All it means is you might have to be a little bit more diligent and intentional with your diet and lifestyle um, to manage it well, to be in that optimal state. Unfortunately, age is something that increases your risk factor for developing insulin resistance. So over the age of 45, we find more cases of insulin resistance, especially if you are a woman in midlife with all the hormones that I kind of walk through. Um, there is a shift that happens in the perimenopause menopause stage, and we tend to be more insulin resistant, which means less tolerant to stress and less tolerant to carbohydrates. Doesn't mean carbohydrates are bad, it just means that we need to find that right tolerance level for you as an individual. And then your nutrition and lifestyle. So an inflammatory diet of like processed foods, toxins, so whether that's what you put on your body, what you inhale in your home, or what you're exposed to, whether in your work or in outside, um, pollution, those kinds of things, those can increase your risk of developing insulin resistance. Just having an unhealthy lifestyle in general, so not getting enough sleep, um, being too stressed out, kind of being negative about life. Um, all of these can significantly decrease your insulin sensitivity and decrease your metabolism, your uh, thyroid function, and uh, increase your disease risk. So how do you turn this around? If you already know you're struggling, um, what are some of the things that you can do? One, I kind of already hinted to this, is clean up your diet. So eat real, nutrient-dense food in the right balance. So what does that mean? So there's macronutrients. Uh, all of our food is divided into macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates. So you want a base of protein, and then you want your non-starchy vegetables to be kind of the foundation for each meal. And then you want to have a balance of fat and starchy carbohydrates or fruit in the real food fam uh, family. Uh, so that could be grains or beans uh, if tolerated, as well as your starchy vegetables and your fruit. Those might need to be adjusted and in balance with your intake of fat. Another strategy that's very successful, tons of research on this, is to eat less often. I was raised to wake up and eat within a half hour and eat every three hours to stoke your metabolism. That is false, right? So you wanna experiment perhaps with intermittent fasting. So this could mean eating later and definitely the research shows closing your eating window earlier. So not eating at night, uh, preferably not eating after dark most days would be actually a great uh, strategy to improve your insulin sensitivity. Um, and another thing you could do if you're not into intermittent fasting is just avoid or minimize snacking. And if you do snack, make sure you're not snacking on only carbohydrates. So maybe instead of the chips or the cookies or the donuts or the bagels, have a snack of something that's more higher in protein, maybe a little bit of fat as well. So that could be nuts or that could be um, a hard boiled egg or something like that. So looking for things that are more based in protein, maybe non-starchy veggies, like some um, celery with hummus, those kinds of things might be uh, a better choice if you do have to snack. And then healthy lifestyle, right? So optimizing your sleep. Even having one bad night of sleep can lower your insulin sensitivity by up to 33%, right? So making sure you're prioritizing your sleep and you're getting good restorative sleep. You wanna move every day. So whether that be a walk or just moving around, you don't wanna be sitting so much. Um, it doesn't have to be excessive. So it doesn't need to be necessarily like a high intensity interval training where you're at the gym for two hours or running miles and miles um, on a treadmill or a Peloton or that kind of thing. You need to find the right dose of movement that feels good in your body and that keeps you balanced, right? So finding, just making sure you're moving every day um, for however much you can, you can handle it. 
Um, and you know, that's going to be unique to the individual as well. Being in nature is a great way to kind of lower cortisol, improve insulin sensitivity, building muscle. So in addition to like walking or hiking or even running, if you can do that, um, doing some strength training is something that can just be body weight types of things, or you can lift weights if you love doing that. Um, anything to help build muscle, increase muscle mass, improves your insulin sensitivity. So that is very clear. And it's also good for our bone health and those kinds of things. Um, I've already talked about sitting, managing stress. This is a big one. So you could have your diet completely perfect, but if you're always stressed out, you might still have insulin resistance and or diabetes um, get, leading into prediabetes or diabetes. So making sure that you are managing your stress, and that can just be with the, like mindset work. That's a lot, a big focus of my work as well with my clients and in my programs, um, working on mindset, making sure you're not emotionally eating those kinds of things or unintentionally mindlessly eating those kinds of things. You also want to minimize your toxic exposure as much as you can for the things that you're actually buying. See if there is a cleaner alternative, a greener alternative that's less toxic. If you smoke, make sure you quit. There's definitely research that shows that insulin uh, resistance uh, is higher in people that smoke cigarettes and alcohol in moderation, right? So that's something that if you enjoy imbibing in alcohol, a glass of wine here and there, just make sure it's in the right balance for your body and then you should be good to go. All right, that's it for me on this topic. If you would like to learn more and just stay connected with me, you can get lots of resources at EvelynDD.com. I have a free download. I have a quiz you can take about uh, for my ladies in, in midlife. Um, if you would like to partake in a free 20 minute discovery session, you can do that here at EvelynDD.com forward slash work with me and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at EvelynDNutritionist.